Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us here in uh, beautiful Boston at ZertoCon. Uh, my name is Mark Crespi. I'm the Vice President of Systems Engineering for North America for Exagrid. Exagrid is a partner of Zerto. In fact, this is our second ZertoCon. Uh, I'm local to Boston. I'm very happy to be here. I was at a conference last week in New Orleans. Needless to say, I shortened my life expect expectancy by five or 10 years being there. So it's good to be back home sleeping in my own bed versus the gutter. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, Exagrid product as it relates to Zerto, and then also just some general things about the Exagrid product as well. So let's start with a little bit about the company. Uh, we are a local Massachusetts company. Um, we're in the disk-based backup with data deduplication space. So typically when people think of what we do, they might also think of Dell EMC data domain or quantum DXI or HP store once or things of that sort. Um, we also um, are an alternative to uh, some of the backup application vendors who build the deduplication and software and tell you to run out and buy cheap, quote, cheap disk uh, to use behind their applications. Um, this is all we do. We're the largest independent vendor in this space. This is, this is a, a sole focus of ours, and therefore, we are experts in the backup layer. And I'll compare and contrast kind of where Zerto's core strengths are and where we're complementary. I have a very large customer base, 10,000 plus systems installed worldwide. We're a global company, both with global product capabilities along with global support capabilities. Before I go any further, I, I'd like to ask a couple of questions if that's okay, and we can do this by a show of hands. How many folks in here today are already existing Zerto customers or, or partners? So just about everybody, okay. And for those of you that are using Zerto, um, for high availability, how many are doing it between data centers that you own, rent, or b manage yourselves? Okay, about half. And how many of you are doing it with um, a cloud service provider on the other side? Okay, great. And how many cloud service provider folks are in here? Great, okay, I, I appreciate that. That helps me kind of tailor my comments. Uh, Exagrid, you know, I'm not going to belabor this point, we're an award-winning company. Um, what sets us apart from the other folks that I mentioned in the category is really our architecture. And the architecture solves a number of problems with traditional backup that were not solved previously in the industry. I'll get into that in some detail. As I mentioned, we're a global company with customers all over the world, both commercial, governmental, federal in the U.S., federal in Canada, et cetera. Uh, there's really not many verticals that we don't have a footprint in uh, as a company. And we have joint customers with Zerto. And I'm gonna explain how we work with, with Zerto uh, in a moment here. So this is an example of a, a global banking and finance company. Um, they've got a number of super critical applications that they can't afford to have be down for any length of time. So they use Zerto to achieve that but they also have to do traditional backup every night and, uh, of the week. So we work both with the fact that they use Zerto with Zerto's backup capabilities at their DR site, but then we also work with their traditional backup application vendor for their nightly backups at the same time. Uh, hundreds of VMs, over 350,000 customers, and like a lot of the customers we work with, their data is growing extremely quickly. And that's a very important point when you think about disk-based backup is, how does your vendor handle data growth? Because data growth can really break both budgets and infrastructures. And they wanted to be able to have retention points to roll back. So in addition to the having live failover and high availability failover, they wanted some retention of their offsite Zerto data uh, so they could go back uh, to points in time as well as, uh, as well as just having the live copy. So as I mentioned, data growth is really a, a big challenge, not only on the primary storage side, not only on the server side, but very much on the backup side. I used to refer to this phenomenon as grow, break, replace. You put a backup infrastructure in place, maybe it was a tape library years ago, we used to replace a lot of tape libraries, now we replace disk vendors. Um, your data grows 20 or 30% a year, which means it's doubling every two and a half years, quadrupling every five years. And the thing you're sending all this data to, you outgrow it, it breaks. You have to rip it out and replace it. Or the vendor says, 
we don't like that thing anymore. I know we, we sold it to you at a high price tag, but we're gonna end a life it, and we're gonna force you either to pay really high maintenance if you wanna keep it, or we want you to buy the next best thing, but you're gonna, be, you're gonna buy, pay to just get back to where you were before you even start talking about expansion. So data growth drives all of that sort of phenomenon along with the vendor's philosophy. So when we set out to tackle the problem of backup, and we first started partnering with Zerto for backup, we decided to try to permanently fix the economics of backup storage. And the way we did it is we looked at every aspect of backup storage that breaks and came up with a way to fix it. So for example, a lot of traditional vendors who are selling you disk-based backup give you a low price to get in. And they either do it by a heavy, heavy discount to get the footprint, or in some cases they undersize you, and you fill up faster than they told you were gonna fill up. Either, in either case, they got in on a low price, and then ne next thing you know, you're expanding before you want to, paying a higher price. We have a lower upfront price, but not only that, we guarantee you in writing that you will never pay a dime more for any future expansion per terabyte than you paid for the first system. And it could be that we came out with a new appliance that's denser, and it'll be lower cost on a per terabyte base. You will never pay more after your initial purchase. This is my favorite trick, the maintenance trick. You, sell, you buy a maintenance contract, uh, I, I, everybody has to increase maintenance a little bit because of inflation, et cetera, but it shouldn't go up 30 or 40% suddenly to force you to buy the next thing. So once again, in writing, we guarantee that we will never increase your maintenance more than 3% per year. And in most, in most cases, it's under 3%. And if you buy a multi-year contract, obviously you get a discount and, and uh, the price is fixed over that period of time. So if you do a three-year contract, we're not gonna come to you in year four and crank up the annualized maintenance by 40%. You also pay service and maintenance on the price you pay for the product. So whatever yourself and our partner work out for a price, that's what you're gonna pay a percentage of that for our support. And we have all the way from simple five by eight phone support all the way up to same day hardware replacement, um, seven by 24, et cetera. So we have global support, uh, enterprise class support capabilities. So the more you beat us up during negotiations and et cetera, you're, you're actually automatically discounting your maintenance costs because we tie it to what you pay, not the list price. Forklift upgrades. Data growth breaks things. In the old tape library days, the tape drives couldn't keep up any longer. Maybe you couldn't upgrade the drives anymore. Maybe there weren't enough slots in the tape library. And ultimately, you have to rip that tape library out, buy a brand new one, start over, all over again. In the disk world, we have the same phenomenon. It's just a more expensive problem in the disk world. So most of the architectures in the market, I'm gonna go over this in detail, look like legacy primary storage architectures. They have a fixed set of compute uh, that does all of the ingest and the deduplication and all the things you need to have um, in a backup storage appliance. And then you just add disk shelves or storage to it. So if you start out with 100 terabyte of data and you buy a system that's capable of two or 300 terabyte of data, and then your data doubles, you now just doubled everything. You doubled the workload, right? You doubled the time the backup's gonna take, the time the deduplication's gonna take, the time uh, replication's gonna take, the time recovery's gonna take, on and on and on and on because you've added twice the workload to a system that got no more performance in its profile. Our architecture is a grid architecture and it's modular. So every time you add capacity, we add a full blown server and it virtualizes into a singly managed system. So if your data doubles from 100 terabyte to 200 terabyte, our performance profile doubles. Backup window stays the same, replication window stays the same, deduplication time stays the same, recovery time stays the same. Everything grows linearly. So it's kind of, an, you can think of it as an infinite growth model where you never have to uh, buy, rip and replace and buy again just to tread water. This also takes the guesswork out of what to buy. So when we talk to customers, we don't try to sell them the most we can, we ask what their budget cycles look like. How much time do you want to plan for? You know, many, some customers only want to buy enough for a year because they know that next year they're just going to have to add another module. It's going to be very inexpensive. They already know what, it, what it's going to cost because we gave a, pr a price guarantee on the first purchase. You don't have to guess whether to buy the larger controller and hope you grow into it later, which means you spent more than you have to, or the smaller controller, which you then outgrow and then you have to buy the larger controller anyway. So there's literally no guesswork. If you have a three-year budget cycle, 
then we'll take you through an exercise where we'll size you for three years. And then in year four, you can buy expansion. So we've made it to match your desires, not our desires. This has a, 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 been a philosophy of ours from day one. We will not obsolete a product. So we, we do not have an end of life policy. We have customers dating, I've been with the company 10 years, we have customers dating back to 2007, 2008, who are still running the very same appliances that they bought then on our latest and greatest software, probably with two or three other generations of appliances that they, bought, that they have bought since. And all of that is backward compatible. Now, do customers come forward and say, hey, I've got some of your smaller boxes, you know, they're getting a little bit old, can we do some kind of consolidation? Of course. So we'll take the, the, the gear on a trade-in value, sell the next generation appliances, everybody's happy, but it's when the customer wants to do it, not when we want you to do it. And there are no hidden costs. So if you got a quote through an Exegrid partner for our product, you would see two line items. The appliance and maintenance. All the features are included. We don't charge you a replication license. We don't charge you a dedupe license. We don't charge you for any other uh, aspect um, at all, unless you add a 10 gig adapter, a uh, 40 gig adapter, excuse me. Um, other than that, that's, that's all you're gonna see on a quote. Also, as a paying maintenance customer, you get all future software releases at no additional cost. So everything we come out with, we just announced a major 5.0 release um, just shortly. All of our existing customers get that release at no cost, despite the fact that it has a lot of great new features in it. So this, the point of this is we've, we've finally said, stop the madness. Stop you know, making me pay for backup storage that I already bought. Let me just buy expansion. And if I want to consolidate later, let me do it when I want to do it, not when my vendor decides um, I'm a revenue source. So where did this architecture come from? We set out to solve those problems, and we looked at you know, the problems tape had, and, when, and everybody agreed at that point in the industry that disk was the answer. But you couldn't get disk to be cost effective without data deduplication because of the number of days, weeks, months, et cetera, that you store data. So where we fit into a, like a Zerto situation, Zerto does the zero RTO stuff, right? The stuff that you gotta fail over right away. We're sitting behind their backup capability at the DR site, and we're sitting behind, if you have a, another backup, you know, sort of traditional, what I call traditional backup application, we're sitting behind that also and replicating that data. So we really are the backup tier. They're the sort of tier zero, tier one, critical application, immediate failover tier. When you look at making disk viable um, economically, you need data deduplication. Pro the problem with backing up the disk before deduplication was so prevalent was that tape was cheap. Everybody hated it. People wanted to burn their tape libraries, <laughs> right? But it was, it was the only economic alternative. If you went and said, I want to back up three months of data to my primary storage, it was probably a career-changing event. But with data deduplication, we brought the economics of disk close enough to tape that the pain of tape could now justify moving to a disk-based appliance. So every vendor who came out with an appliance did the first two things. Added deduplication for storage efficiency to varying degrees. There are good algorithms and moderate algorithms out there. And then they added uh, replication and used deduplication for bandwidth efficiency. Yes, sir? Yes. Yes, it's in that category. Yep, data, uh, Dell EMC data domain is number one. It's also the, the largest part of our business right now is replacing it. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you why. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Thanks for that. But um, yeah, that, that's the, the, they're the category leader. Um, and and they, were, they are a great company and We, ha we have, through a partnership, we have the ability to do IBM, yep. We have a, a, an expert partner that provides a device that does that for us. Okay. That, our product manager's in the back uh, of the room, too, so he can, you can corner him after this, because I'm kind of a sales guy, but not quite. <laughs> yeah. 
Are you nodding yes to all of those, or? <laughs> okay. Yeah, perfect. So everybody kind of stopped here, and they left some problems behind. One of the problems is you want really fast backups. And most of the implementations of deduplication in the market today deduplicate the data stream as it's flowing. We, we elected not to do that. We created a version of deduplication called adaptive deduplication. And what adaptive deduplication does is it lets the segments of the backups land in chunks first, and then we start deduplicating and replicating it in parallel while the backups are running. But the difference is, is that we monitor the utilization of the resources of our devices, and if we think the deduplication at the rate it's running is gonna interfere with a backup window and, and make it longer, we throttle back. If we see open spots in the evening, or we see that we're underutilized, then we crank it up. So you get a similar behavior to inline data deduplication, but without the drawback of interfering with backups, regardless of um, how fast they're running. A, a very important side effect of that is we now have a fully hydrated copy of your most recent set of backups in what we call a landing zone or a high-speed cache. And th this became especially important with the advent of these new advanced backup recovery techniques that all, just about all the vendors support called instant VM recovery. And what this is is where you've got a virtual machine that went down. Maybe it's not in your high availability tier, so you don't have a failover option. And you just want to boot it off the backup target and get it back up and running very quickly. If you do that off of deduplicated virtual machines, it can take a very, very long time. I was with one of our customers that's uh, in Dallas, they're a large mortgage company, and they were previously a, a, a Dell EMC data domain customer. Their exchange server went down, and it was down for a day. They tried to boot it off of the backup storage, and it took almost a day. They did a proof of concept with us, and it took five minutes. So it, it's a big difference when you have to rehydrate data versus when you have your most recent copy. And then finally is the, the grid-based architecture that I'm talk, gonna talk about here in a moment, which is if you go to disk, you, one of the reasons is because it's faster, you want your backup window to be quick and you don't want it to grow. So by adding capacity and performance in lockstep, that backup window is not gonna grow. So to close out on these important concepts, we have this thing called the unique landing zone. It avo avoids doing the data deduplication in line and monitors the fact that we have time to do deduplication in parallel without slowing the backups down. And it gets the data offsite as quickly as inline does, which is important for getting your backups offsite. And again, the unique landing zone comes into play a lot with instant VM recovery, it, but it has other, there's other factors. If you had to do a restore of a big Oracle database that's not virtualized, as an example, you could do that very quickly from an exagrid. If you do tape outs for long-term archiving, as an example, that would be very fast with an exagrid because it's gonna come out of that landing zone. This is probably the most important aspect of the architecture, and it's kind of where we came up with the name, uh, putting the word grid in our name. If you look at the traditional architectures that are out there, and just about every appliance vendor other than us falls in the category on the left. You have a controller. It has a certain amount of compute, certain amount of memory, maybe a bit of flash, certain amount of uh, uh, network ports, et cetera, and that's all you get. Then you start strapping disk shelves to it as your data grows and the disk shelves are not necessarily inexpensive. And then you're gonna hit points where that controller runs out of gas. And you either have to start another silo, which is very expensive, because the controllers are expensive, or you have to forklift upgrade out the controller, buy a bigger one, and start all over again. So you're spending the same dollars or more just to get back to where you were, and then you add the expansion cost on top of that. Or the vendor decides to end the life of the thing two years after you bought it, no one wants to be the last customer of a product that goes end of life. I've been in that boat. Pretty painful. And it goes off of support, and they tell you, if you want to keep going with us, you can buy, buy the next one. Right? Very uncomfortable conversation, I would think. If you look at the architecture on the right, because it's grid-based, every module of our product is an identical server. So our largest appliance is what we call the EX40000E. It's capable of handling a 40 terabyte full backup and holding roughly 16 weeks worth of images associated with that backup. You can strap up to 25 of those together to create a system that can handle a petabyte. And it will ingest data at 200 terabyte per hour provided the environment can push it that hard. 
as you look at that growth, at no point is there a breakage point. So even if you hit a petabyte of data, and the customer that I just mentioned actually has five petabytes of data, they have five grids. All, all managed through a, a, a very simple web, web interface. Um, happy as a clam. Yep. Okay. Oh, I believe it. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the answer is possibly. It depends on a couple of variables. So we don't do Azure as of yet, but we do do Amazon AWS. Um, the, the, the we actually use S3 in frequent access, and the reason is, is that it actually ends up being cheaper than Glacier. Um, so w the, the, the factor you've got to think about is, is that the, the life cycle policy of the data has to be managed by somebody and that's typically gonna be your backup application vendor. So if the backup application vendor, and this wouldn't, this wouldn't be a Zerto use case, this would be a traditional you know, uh, legacy backup application use case. That, that, that vendor has to have a storage lifecycle life policy management capability of some sort that says, okay, I've got an on-premise exagrid, I'm gonna keep 12 weeks for operational recovery, I'm gonna replicate that to AWS, but then I'm also gonna take you know, week 13, month four, year six, and I'm gonna also push that over to the AWS instance uh, of Exagrid. And the reason you need that is you need that, some, some software has to be aware those images exist, so you need it in the catalog, which is why we have to rely on the backup software. We don't, we don't have an uh, independent catalog of the data. I don't, no one in this industry, in this category, has, keeps their own catalogs. We all rely on the, the backup app for movement. So, Tom, did I miss anything? Okay, Tom, Tom's my, what do, they, what do they call it on uh, who wants to be a millionaire, lifeline, or plus one? I, wa I watch far too much television apparently. So if you look at it from an ingest performance perspective, um, you can see with the Exagrid that, that ingest performance is gonna grow with data. Whereas your scale up architectures, and this includes by the way the, the software vendors that that try to entice you by saying, just go buy a bunch of cheap, deep storage and throw it behind our software, you're still gonna have the performance problem because the media server is now the bottleneck. And if, the, if you have longer retention, more than four or five weeks, you're gonna have disk sprawl because their deduplication rates are gonna be lower because it's being done in software versus in a dedicated appliance. So da data growth is a big, should be a big factor in, in what you'll ultimately decide to back up to. Um, so this kind of relates to the gentleman's question about our cloud options. In, in addition to AWS, we have a variety of different partners. Um, one of them is called Offsite Data Sync as an example. And they will offer you an Amazon-like offering using Exagrid technology. So they will purchase the gear on your behalf and they will charge you as an operational expense. And the difference between that and say an AWS or an Azure is it's a fully private model. So you know your data is on dedicated gear, only your data is on that gear, and if you needed that data back for any reason, they ship it to you. So they can overnight the device to you and make it available to you right away. With AWS or Azure, you gotta pull it back over the, uh, over the WAN, which may or may not matter. If it's just something that's gonna be static and sit there and you, and you think you're never gonna need it, that may be fine. Um, but we have a, a network of providers like that that will do that for you. And then obviously you can ho host it in your own data center or in a co-location facility as well. Uh, we very efficiently use your bandwidth. We reduce the data by about a factor of 50 over the WAN. Um, full throttling capabilities if it's shared bandwidth, et cetera. Um, and the other thing we, we can do that's interesting is because we have that landing zone uh, part of the product, and then where, where the deduplicated data is stored is called our repository. When, when we say we have a 40 terabyte appliance, it's actually 80 terabyte of usable disk. And for disaster recovery, if you're not landing backups, 
we can zero that landing zone out and make it 80 terabyte of deduplicated data. So that really kills the economics at the DR site. It really crushes down the price per, price per gigabyte for your DR data. And our partners can do that as well. So it, that, that helps save on the uh, operational expense. We work with a bunch of different environments. We have to say this, we're agnostic, we love Zerto. Um, but a lot of environment, you know, Zerto is complementary in, in many cases to most of the backup apps. I think, you know, a couple of them might have a feature they think competes with Zerto, but I don't think they're anywhere near as robust as Zerto's product is as a feature within a backup app. But we do typically find customers will have some form of a traditional backup app running, even if they're doing high availability. We also work with some pretty interesting uh, uh, innovative storage and software vendors. Um, Veeam is one of them. Uh, not so much Nimble anymore since HP gobbled them up. Uh, Nutanix, who I think is here. I'm not sure if Pure is here. I mentioned Offsite Data Sync. And ATS Cloud is kind of uh, uh, another version of Offsite Data Sync in uh, the Texas area that will do cloud services for you. Which, uh, I'm sorry, which companies? Yeah, it's a, it's a backup target for backup software. Right. Correct. Yes. That's right. That's right. So in reality, you're managing our devices through some application. It could be Zerto it, uh, for your high availability, or I mean for the backup side of, of the Zerto product. It could be Veritas if you're using that as a traditional backup application because they don't do high availability. So you know, if you're running Veritas and you have critical virtual machines, you still need Zerto, right? Because Veritas is a backup application. So your, R your RPO is whenever you last ran a backup, right? So, um, th but yes, Veritas would be the one driving the data to the local device. And Veritas is one of the applications, by the way, when I was talking earlier, that can manage a, a deeper catalog at another location, including AWS, as an example. These guys are more um, the diverse than the last slide. So, you know, Veeam's a backup app, Zerto is a high availability with a backup capability, three storage players, and then two cloud players. So these are more ecosystem complementary partners versus, um, except for uh, Veeam and Zerto, there, you know, there's, no, there's no direct integration per se. So how do we actually work with Zerto? So Zerto's strength, obviously, is getting you to, to a zero recovery time objective for your critical applications. And we don't play in that part of the equation. They've got that well covered, great company. Um, great uh, technology, et cetera. However, they have a backup capability at the offsite location where you can take images and back them up and keep retention of those images if that's required. That's where we play. So we would sit at the offsite Zerto location if you were, ju if you were just using us with Zerto and we would be a target for the backup feature that Zerto supports. That's where we would fit in a Zerto environment. In many customers that we work with, we also find a legacy nightly backup application of some sort. A net backup, a Veeam, um, uh, TSM in some cases, Networker in other cases, et cetera. And we would work with that nightly backup application for your traditional backup requirements. And these are typically, you know, people typically back up their entire environment um, from tier, tier zero, tier one, all the way down to, you know, what, wherever the, lowest tier of data you have is. And we would take that data in, and we would replicate that off to the DR site as well. So in, in, a, in a sense, this model is, is replacing the, uh, the model where we used to give our tapes over to Iron Mountain, and they would drive away with them in a truck, right? You get the data to a geographically dispersed location in case something bad happens at your primary site. And we can do this for pairs of sites, and we can do this for hub and spoke as well. So if you, have, you can have up to 16 data centers um, in a single Exegrid installation. Yep. Yep. 
Yes, we only replicate the deduplicated data. Right, so on average, if you back up a terabyte to us, we're gonna ship 20 gigabyte. Yep. The hardware itself, uh, highly redundant. Um, RAID 6 with a hot spare, so you know, it, what I tell customers, the, the most common component failure in any of these types of devices is you lose a disk drive once in a while. Uh, and we do a lot of things in our manufacturing to, to you know, weed out infant mortality and that sort of thing. But there's literally a hot spare sitting in the in device waiting for that to happen so it heals itself without intervention. Typically, you'll get an alert. Our support organization will get an alert. You come in the morning, there's a drive on your desk. You swap out the one with the big red light on it. Uh, power supplies are redundant, so it can run on uh, one if, if you lose one. And you can bond the NICs for high throughput. We also do support encryption at rest. And my recommendation to customers is, obviously, if you have the re encryption requirement, buy our encrypting devices. They are, it's a separate part of our product line because we elected to do the encryption in the hardware because we saw the software encryption Im implementations on top of de uh, deduplication, on top of replication, on top of some of the other uh, uh, processes that some of the guys have to run, like reclamation, which is not something we run, but all the other block level products do. And then you throw encryption on top of it, and we said, well, when, when's this gonna break? So we do it in the hardware. The only time you lose the duplication capabilities is if you encrypt it before you send it. So, it, yeah, so if it hits our device, where, where our encryption actually lives is in the disk drives themselves. So they're called self-encrypting drives. So in every device, let's say the device has 16 drives, we've got 16 little encryption engines running constantly as the, the data is coming in. But it's deduplicated prior to, to, to landing at rest. So it's, 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 you still get all the benefit of deduplication and the deduped data is encrypted. As, as is the landing zone data. Right, yeah. Everything's, everything's deduplicated. And the, the performance impact is I immeasurable because we're doing it in the drives. So every drive is carrying its share of, of the load. The reason I recommend uh, to customers who aren't sure if they need encryption to buy the encrypting devices is it, it is a separate product line. It's the one place where we would have to replace non-encrypting gear with encrypting gear in order to get that performance benefit. The, the cost differential is very minor between our non-encrypting and our encrypting. So I always say, look, if you think there's even a chance in you know, a million that you're gonna eventually need encryption, buy, buy the encryption devices now and just don't turn it on and then turn it on when you need it. It's not gonna break the bank. Uh, another unique aspect of us as a company is our customer support model. And we get compliments on this all the time. Rather than give you an 800 number and say you're on your own and you call in, in, into a big pool and you get a phone tree and um, you, know, you have to go through all the, did you reboot it, did you do this, did you do that? We assign you a person at installation time. And that person is your support engineer for the duration of the relationship. Um, this solves a lot of problems. One is you get to know the person and they get to know you. So every time you call in, you're not re-explaining a question or a problem, and you don't have to re-explain re your environment either. They get very uh, knowledgeable on your environment. We also assign them based on what's running in your environment. So if you're a Zerto customer and running a, another backup application for traditional stuff, we're gonna assign you to a support engineer that's been trained on Zerto and that backup application. So in many instances, we find we get calls Customers frustrated because they tried to call the legacy backup application uh, support, got the runaround, come to us, and we end up able to answer the question because we have been trained on it. So this really helps with a lot of the silliness, and I ran support organizations early in my career, a lot of the silliness around you know, having to start over every single time you call into a support organization. And then obviously if there's vacation, we do let them take vacations. We take the, the ankle shackle off once in a while and stuff like that. They have a backup that will uh, cover you for those instances where, where your person may not be around. Um, everything, it really is customer install, installable and serviceable, right? It, in many cases, it's kind of an annoyance to have to have somebody show up at your data center, you gotta sign them in at the front desk, you gotta get them into the data center, you gotta stand there and watch them swap a drive, and it takes up your valuable time. So it's actually easier just to 
swap a drive in really quickly. However, if you need that capability, if you have a remote data center or something like that, we do have four hour on-site labor response. So we can do that, but most customers like the idea of just quickly you know, swapping the drive themselves. I mentioned the releases. We also do health status monitoring, so the system will alert conditions, and it also has a phone home capability that it'll send statistics on a daily basis to your support engineer. So they can look and see our, dr our drive errors mounting on, on uh, one of your drives. Should we, should we proactively replace it? Um, if they see sudden data growth, they'll pick up the phone and say, did you add a bunch of data? Because they, they want to make sure that something bad didn't happen and your dedupe ratios were off or something like that. So they, they monitor for that type of stuff. Um, and this is all included in the program. There's no, there's no extra charges for us to monitor the system. We, we, we like to think of our support as an extension to your teams because we know IT has a lot, a lot more to do than just backup and DR in many cases. So that's about it. Um, hopefully that was helpful. Um, but uh, and hopefully I left a little time for questions. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, it, it, it varies depending on the methodology of the backup. So in uh, traditional backups, after about 12 weeks, we'll get about a 20 to 1 deduplication ratio. When you start doing things like change block tracking or uh, in some situations with some of the backup app partners, we actually ha have them leave their deduplication on. So we have one partner, for example, that gets about a 2 to 1 deduplication ratio in their software. We have them leave it on. They also do change block tracking, so we'll get a five or six or seven to one on that data. And your, your end result at that point is gonna be the combination of the two. So the total savings, you know, if we get five to one and they get two to one would be 10 to one. So it can vary depending on the backup methodology. It also varies on the makeup of the data. So any responsible deduplication vendor is gonna ask you a bunch of questions about your data. How much of it is image data? How much of it is pre-compressed? To the gentleman's point, are you pre-encrypting any of it? And that, that gives us some predictability as to what you'll see. And because we have so many systems installed globally, and 95% of those are sending us deduplication statistics every day, we really have a good idea of what the next customer is going to look like based on what you know, the thousands of previous customers look like. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, that's one of the things that we're looking at. Uh, yeah, is, is that Tom? Deduplication really shines when it sees the same thing over and over and over again. And, and the change rate is what, is what drives how powerful it might be. And it also, you gotta watch out for the algorithms. There's a whole bunch of aspects to deduplication algorithms that you have to sort out. You know, things like, is it large fixed blocks? Is it small fixed blocks? Is it variable length? There's a, a bunch of jargon you gotta wade through to, to kinda understand if the algorithm's aggressive or not. Yes, sir. No, we're, we're Ethernet, exclusively Ethernet. Um, and the reason we did that, in the early days, for fiber channel connectivity, you had to do virtual tape. You had to do a VTL. And the problem with that is all of the advanced features that I just talked about, like instant VM recovery, et cetera, et cetera, don't work with tape. And the minute you make disk look like tape, the backup software thinks it's tape. So it does silly things like fast forward, rewind, eject, all that sort of thing. So we we... We noticed that the fiber market was somewhat eroding because Ethernet was gaining so much ground and we elected to sort of walk away from the fiber market in the early days. Um, I believe there's some connectivity now that does it. I think if, if you're using like net backup, uh, they have appliances you can connect that to fiber without a, a VTL interface, but m most of the, like the Dell EMCs of the world, et cetera, you gotta, put, you gotta put, turn on VTL. So it, it really is gonna depend. One of the things that can drive up the, pri the, the cost is if you're doing retention management, like grandfather, father, son as an example, right? Where you're, where, you're, where you're keeping 12 monthlies and then you convert it to a yearly and then you convert it, you know. Um, you're manipulating the data. And Amazon charges you to manipulate data. And they charge you a lot to manipulate data in Glacier. 
and is also very, 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 very slow. Glacier, Glacier really is an archive play, a true archive play. If you have data that you think is 99.9% .9 chance you're never going to need it again, but you got to keep it because of regulation or whatever you know, reason, then Glacier is a great place because you just put it there and you leave it there. The minute you go to read it, touch it, delete it, you get, you get a bill that's going to blow your mind. S3 and frequent access has some of those same charges, but they're not as dramatic. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Can we record this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'd have to ask the partner if they would take existing gear or not. We would have no, no objection whatsoever. Um, so why don't, why don't, I'll give you my card at the end of this, and, and uh, we can talk about what, who would, might be a good partner to approach. But it would have to be up to them. We do, we'll, we'll take trade-in value if you want to consolidate um, or, or if you want to outsource. We can take that as trade-in value and, and apply that to the partner. So um, if, if, a, if you, let's say you have four nodes in a grid and one node goes down. So the data going to that node and the data resident on that node, you, know, you, you won't be able to back up or recover to or from it well, during the outage. However, the other three nodes are up and running. So you're 75% you're still up and running. With some of our software integrations, with certain applications, they've built um, a virtualization layer that does load balancing and failover. One example is Oracle RMAN. They have a feature called Channels. So if you're backing up Oracle RMAN to an exagrid, it, it, it will literally notice that a, a node went down and fail that backup over to a, a node that's running. So in that instance, there's no impact to backups. Obviously, the historical data on the failed node would not be recoverable. That's actually unique compared to the single controller architectures where if the one computing element goes down, you're, da you're down. Nothing can happen. So we give a little bit better availability. I don't call it high availability. I call it medium availability because we're, we still will be partially running. Um, and anyone tells you that a node never goes down, <laughs> I wouldn't buy that for a minute, but it's rare. So the, w the way you we get you out of that is you get a, a new empty chassis, you pull the drives out of the failed node, put the drives in the new chassis, power it up, and now it's, it's back because everything that's required for that node to work is on the drives. So there's no hardware component in the failed system that prevents that new chassis from becoming that system. Anything else? All right. Well, have a great lunch. Thanks for your time.